You are listening to part two of a two-part mailbag episode where I will answer questions from my inbox. I received a bunch of really, really good questions about the 2024 NBA draft. So stay tuned to find out who is my biggest freshman sleeper that has not received all of the fanfare as the top five picks or the or the five stars or the projected lottery picks to find out who is my freshman sleeper stay tuned Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board and the founder of NBA Draft Junkies. And if you are a new listener, like, share, subscribe. Again, there is no off season on NBA Big Board. It is August and we're still pumping out content, even though. It is August, like I mentioned in the last episode. There is some basketball being played with the colleges going on international tours, which I think is an absolutely dope experience. Me personally, I love, like absolutely love traveling abroad. I love living in Europe. I love European basketball. And I think it's just awesome that the schools are giving these kids, some kids probably have never really been outside of the country giving these kids an opportunity to travel and see the world and go visit these historic sites. Like I saw like on Instagram, there's a team in Israel and, and they're visiting like Jerusalem. I've seen the teams in Spain and, and USC is playing in Mykonos. I mean, I just think it's, it's really awesome just giving these players an opportunity to travel and get outside of their comfort zone, see how the, the world operates and, see life outside of America. I know for me, I am planning to spend significant time in Europe this upcoming season. I think this is going to be a, a pretty strong international class, even though a bunch of the international players are playing in the States. And that's the episode that I have planned coming soon about who are the top international players in the United States and who are the top international players playing abroad because you have players they're not only just playing in Europe now. You, you have a really talented group of players that will be playing in Australia at the NBL or in the NBL. So this is going to be a fun year for me just because I really have a, a thing for the international prospects. So, again, I'm enjoying seeing all the teams that are traveling in Europe. All right, let me just get right to the questions. Who are your biggest sleepers? So there's two names that come to mind my biggest sleepers that people aren't really talking about. One is a kid from Baylor. Eves Messi. Went to prolific prep, is a center, very raw. He's only been playing basketball for three years. But when I watch his film, I see an incredible upside. When I put out my, my big board that was coming out next week you're going to be surprised where i have him now he was highly touted i'm not saying like he's a guy that came out of nowhere it's not like he's a one star two star three star recruit he played at prolific prep so there are you know people that know him he wasn't a mcdonald's all-american but i think his upside is incredible considering that he's new to the game he is still raw but he makes some plays here and there where you're like wow whether it's Facing up, putting the ball on the floor, crashing every rebound, blocking shots. I think that he is going to be one of the biggest surprises in college basketball this year. And then my next sleeper, I really love this guy's game. Didn't put up big numbers. If you weren't really paying attention, you could have totally missed him. But it is Guillermo Diaz Graham from Pitt. This is a guy that I think is going to blow up. Now, he has a twin brother on the team also. He's a seven-footer. He's agile. He's coordinated. He's skilled. He can put the ball on the floor. Natural scoring instinct. I saw a play where he was running the floor, and the, the point guard passed him the ball in transition. A guy goes to take a charge. He euro steps around him, finishes with the layup. Again, this is a seven-footer. 
He has upside as a shooter. Didn't shoot a great percentage from three, but came on really late in the season. Had a big game in the NCAA tournament against Xavier. He can block shots. Nice skinny. Needs to get stronger. But I think he's a poor man's Chet Holmgren. Like, if you just look at the way he moves and runs the floor, the ability to potentially be a floor spacer. I mean, he made threes this year, and I saw that in Pitts. I don't know where they're playing. I think they're playing in Spain because him and his twin brother are from the Canary Islands in, in, in Spain, which is, like, outside of the coast of Africa. But I think that's where Pitt is playing, and he's made threes in some of the scrimmages there. I think the kid is really gifted. I think he's going to blow up. Whether he's someone that is in the 24 draft, I don't know. Maybe he's kind of makes a name for himself in 24 and then ends up being one of the top guys in 25. I'm not sure, but I am totally, totally intrigued by the talent and the upsides and upside. We don't see seven footers as skilled and that move the way he moves. So remember the name, Guillermo Diaz-Graham. Those are my two biggest sleepers for 2024 right now. And there's some other guys that I, that I have in that mix, but those are the guys that really, really caught my attention. All right, the next question is, will you be paying attention to the NBL and their Next Stars program? Of course, of course. A.J. Johnson is the, the name that, kind of, I think, headlines the Next Stars program. Or, or you can say it's, it's Bobby Clintman. But they have a couple guys that I believe could be first-round talents. Then you have Alex Saar. I think Alex Saar, if, if you heard the last episode, I talked about Zachary Reese this year. I think Alex Saar is in the same, in the same, I don't I don't know the word I'm trying to use. I think Alex Saar and Zachary Reese this year are the same. And I don't want you to say that I'm picking on French prospects. Because obviously I like Wimbeyama, I like Bilal Koulibaly. Kamani um, Huenshu for Washington State is one of my favorite players. So I don't want you to think that I'm knocking French prospects. But I do think that Alex Saar is similar to Zachary Reese's share. I think when it comes to skill level, natural talent, gifts, the tools to play in the modern NBA and be superstars, I think they both have the same they have the tools I should say but I think both lack that competitive fire to dominate and just take over games if you put a different mindset in them I mean I could say that both of those guys could be in consideration to be the top pick in the draft that's how skilled and talented they are I just think that Sar just lacks that that fire, that next gear of being a dog that could prevent him from maximizing his potential. Because he has all the tools. I mean, he has the size at 6'11". He moves well. I think there's upside as a shooter. Just the fluidity and skill set. Has some wing skills. I and mean, I think he, Alex, Alexander Saar is extremely talented. Now, he will be coming to the States in September playing against the Ignite in a showcase. I'll be looking forward to that. I really will be looking forward to that. I plan on being there. And so maybe that can, can change the perception. But I will be paying attention to the NBL Next Stars program. I like Taron Armstrong a lot. I think that he is, is, is fun. He is someone that you can't really keep your eyes off of because he's such a gifted, confident passer, whips passes from all over the floor. I like him a lot. He is... Just another big playmaker coming from Australia. So he'll be fun to watch. But yeah, I'll definitely be paying close attention to the Next Stars program because there's a lot of talent in Australia and New Zealand. All right, the next question is, I know you're from Omaha. Shout out to Omaha, home of Terrence Bud Crawford. And you follow Creighton. Where do you see Trey Alexander going next June? I think Trey has a chance to be a first-round pick. He will have a, a bigger role in the offense this year with um, Kaluma leaving, Arthur Kaluma leaving, and Ryan Nimhart transferring. As a person that follows Creighton, that kind of hurt. I, I thought if Creighton would have been able to retain 
all of their guys, they would have been one of the best teams in the country this year. They, they were last year, got off to a good start. Then they had this stretch where they couldn't win games and they ended up finishing pretty strong. But I would have loved to see that group stay together, but it's college basketball. It's not often you get a, a really talented team stays together. They have, last year I felt like they had five guys that I think could see time in the NBA at one point or another. But Alexander is probably the guy that I think would be their, he's their best NBA prospect. You know, you can make a case for Ryan Kalkbrenner. I definitely think that he'll, again, have an increased scoring load. And I see him as someone that is a potential first-round pick. I think coming back was the right decision. I don't think that if he left, he would have been a first-round pick. I still think he would have been a second-round guy, maybe been a two-way player if he left in June. But I think that if he plays well, Creighton wins. Like I said, he can be a, a first-round pick. Right. When we return, I will answer a question about Spanish big man and UCLA signee Adai Mara. He is one of the hottest names in the draft world because he had such a strong summer. But first, let's talk about FanDuel. Football season is about to kick off, and with FanDuel, you have an opportunity to win all season long. Because right now, when you pick a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time that team wins. For me, I'm going with the Bengals. But just pick a team, Bengals, Cowboys, whoever, and you'll get bonus bets every time they win. And you can use your bonus bets on the spreads, player props, overs, unders, and more. All you have to do is visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. And you can start earning bonus bets with America's number one sports book. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. All right, once again, thank you for making the Locked On NBA Big Board podcast your first listen of the day. Let's get right back to the questions. And the question is, what are your thoughts on Adai Mara? And can he play in the modern day NBA? That is the million dollar question. Mara is someone that I've been following for a few years. He's seven foot three. And he had a really, really good summer plan for the, the Spanish national team. He is someone that can, I mean, he's very skilled and talented. I've seen some people compare him to Pau Gasol because he can score with the right hand, the left hand. He's very efficient around the rim. He moves well. I think his greatest skill set might be his passing. He has a very high basketball IQ, gifted passer. I mean, I've seen him throw behind the back passes from the mid post, hook passes across the floor. He is a solid rim protector, I think, is more so just because of his size and presence. It's not like he's quick off the ground and he's swatting shots all over the place. But you do have to factor in how big he is and how he can plug up the middle just, again, off his sheer size. He shows some promise as a floor spacer. I think he's, he's going to be able to knock down the 15-foot shot, shots from the short corner. He's a pick-and-pop threat. Can't space the floor. I don't think that he'll be able, well, I don't, I should put it like this. I think he can space the floor. I don't know if he has NBA shooting range just yet. The big question about Mara and his NBA fit and role is can he defend in space? Is he a good enough defender? Is he mobile and agile enough to defend in the NBA where the floor is spread out. I mean, sometimes when you watch an NBA game and you watch a college game or even a game in Europe, the NBA floor looks significantly bigger because of all the floor spacing. So that is the biggest concern. I think sometimes it's, it's easy if you see a guy that is not jumping out the gym and he's not an explosive athlete to be concerned about whether or not he can defend in space. I know that was kind of the knock on Jokic. That was kind of the knock on Alperen Shingun. And Amar is going to face the same questions. And so I think in college basketball, because the floor is not as spaced, we won't really get a, an opportunity to see him defend um, out on the perimeter as much because you can play zone and you can just park him near the rim and just tell him to change everything around the basket. So that's going to be like the one of the hotter topics, I believe, all season long. But again, offensively, very, very fundamentally sound 
can shoot the mid range, score in the post, footwork, touch, passing. He has it all on the offensive end of the floor. All right, the next question is. Who is your comparison for Mark Mitchell? Mark Mitchell is a sophomore at Duke who played out of position last year. I think he's a natural four. I don't really have a great comparison other than Jabari Walker comes to mind. Now, Jabari, Jabari shot the ball lights out as a freshman i think it was like 50 percent from the floor from three as a freshman even though it was on a small sample size jabari has a, a great motor he is has a really really good motor um but i think mark mitchell is kind of in that mode as a guy that is is like a hybrid three four that that has some wing skills but his best position is at the four I think he's going to be a guy that just plays a long time in the NBA as a role player. Maybe a back-end rotation guy, but definitely someone that I can see on the roster. But again, I don't have like a great, great comparison for him. But I like him overall. And it's, it'd be interesting to see how he plays this year at Duke because I think that he is going to be able to play more so at his natural position or play the position that I think he'll play in the NBA. All right, the next question is the best freshman people aren't really – Talking about, I mentioned Fee Messi from Baylor. Um, Garway Duol, hopefully I pronounced that right, from Providence. I really like him. I'm, I'm really intrigued by his skill set. He's like a 6'3", six, 6'4", six, point guard, smooth athlete, loves to get downhill. I think he has some upside as a playmaker and passer, good core vision, long arms, great pace. I love his pace to the game. I, when I watch his film and watch him play, I don't really see him shoot a lot of jumpers. And he really didn't have to on the high school level because he was able to get to his spots. He's someone that I've seen some people that are high on. And then I've seen some people who really just don't know a lot about him. But he is a freshman that I, I feel like not enough people are talking about. All right. When you return, I have two more questions about Michigan State freshman Xavier Booker and Florida State's. Baba Miller. Stay tuned. All right. Last question. Last question. There's been like 15 questions that I handpicked that I wanted to, to answer. And if you sent me a question and I didn't answer it, I'll get back to it in another episode because it is August and we have plenty of time until college basketball starts. All right, the next question is, how do you think Xavier Booker will look at Michigan State? I think he's talented. Talented. I think he's talented enough to be a top five pick, but he doesn't have that type of buzz right now. Booker is very talented. I think there's real promise as a shooter. He's 6'11 or, or seven foot, can move, can block shots. The motor. Kind of like Khalil where the motor and the consistency in playing hard are the concerns. Now, you got to be tough to play for Izzo. Now, Izzo, Izzo's old school. And if Izzo can get that out of him, getting him to play hard, not saying that he doesn't play hard, but just getting him to play hard at a consistent level, making sure that he's playing hard and he's bringing energy and effort and, and motor. If Izzo can get that out of him, Booker could end up being a top 10 pick. I mean, he has the tools to be really good. And unfortunately, it sounds like a theme with, with some big man. Like if the big is skilled and he has the size and there's things that he does well, like shooting, sometimes that like impacts their motor. Like there's a, a high school kid I'm not gonna mention his name but if you really follow high school basketball you can probably figure out who I'm talking about the kid is like seven two seven three I think that if he puts it all together he could be a special player but he just doesn't play hard like the and he teased me the first game I saw him play he had like five threes at like seven two and I thought like oh my gosh I gotta write this kid's name down this kid is going to be the next big thing and then after that the rest of the tournament he did absolutely nothing motor 
didn't run, no effort, just, and I hate saying this word, just soft, right? And so for some reason, I think that is a, a, a tendency to find guys that if they're, if they're seven foot or 6'11", and they're skilled and they move well, they don't always play with intensity. And so Booker is someone that I feel like falls into that category. If he played hard, I mean, I guess if everybody had Russell Westbrook's motor and mentality, then everybody would be really good. But I think that if Booker just played with a little bit more intensity, he'd be a lottery pick. I mean, he'd be somebody that we would be talking about as a potential top five pick. All right, the last question is, you were high on Baba Miller last year. Where are you this year? Yeah, I was high on Baba Miller. I was putting him in the first round because of his skill set. I mean, he's extremely skilled, 6'10", had a growth spurt. Baba Miller's a sophomore at Florida State from Spain, played in the Real Madrid, Real Madrid system, had like this BS suspension that forced him to miss, I think, the first 16 games of the season. So when he did start playing for Florida State, he was halfway through the season. And I'll be honest, he didn't look good. He didn't look good. I thought he would play a lot better. The adjustment was obviously a lot, a lot more difficult than I expected. He didn't really shoot the ball well, show glimpses and flashes. I mean, of course, you're going to be intrigued with a guy that's 6'10", that is fluid and agile, that can handle the ball, that can make plays. Where am I at on him now? First round talent. I'm not as high on him right now as I was last year. And maybe it's just the natural of it's hard to unsee what I saw last year at Florida State. Again, I was hyped. Like when he made his debut, I was tuned in. I thought he was going to show flashes. After the first game, I was like, okay, he's rusty. The second game, I was like, it'll be better. It just didn't get a whole lot better for Baba Miller. He was on the, the Spanish national team this summer, and I thought he had a good summer, but he didn't dominate like I thought he would. And yeah, I just, I just it's, it's hard for me to unsee what I saw last, last season, but hopefully I'm, I'm wrong. But I would definitely like to see him regain some of the buzz, at least that I have for him, whether it's, you know, aggressively attacking the rim, knocking down shots, getting rebounds, grabbing and going. I would just like to see him be a little bit more assertive and, and dominant in, in his play. But again, I like the skill set, I like the talent, and I think he's a first round pick. Well, that wraps up this episode. This was part two of a mailbag episode. Again, I had a I mean, I don't know how many, but I had quite a few dozens of questions in my inbox and I handpicked about 15 to answer. In the next episode, Richard Stamen will be on. And of course, we're going to talk about guys that we like in 2024. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow and I am 